I am frankly quite annoyed uh, that our sitting vice president and the presumptive nominee of the Democratic Party for the presidency has decided to go to a sorority house today um, instead of meeting the prime minister of Israel. What's your take on that? Well, I think you should be annoyed. I think anyone who's a member of the pro-Israel community in the United States should be annoyed. But I think it's of a piece of what we're coming to expect from Kamala Harris. You know, she's given two major speeches uh, since she became the presumptive uh, Democratic nominee within 48 hours of President Biden dropping out of the race. And in those speeches, she really telegraphed that she's going to be a much more progressive, much more liberal candidate and potential president than Joe Biden, which is saying something because Joe Biden's presidency has been quite to the left, I think more to the left than most people expected. Exactly. But she's talking about new entitlements and on foreign policy, she's already sending signals that she's going to be more dovish and she's going to be more hostile to Israel than Joe Biden has been. So I think skipping the Netanyahu address is a sign of where she thinks the relationship is headed. She says she's gonna meet private, privately with him later in the week. But I also think it speaks to another issue with the Democrats, Morgan, and that is the growing anti-Semitic feeling and uh, sentiment within the Democratic Party. I don't think Kamala Harris wants to be seen with Benjamin Netanyahu, much less being in a position where she will have to applaud the things that he says and, yeah. and would be expected to applaud. And so that, I think, doesn't speak well of her, doesn't speak well of what's happening to the Democrats. No, it doesn't. I think we have over 100 that are so far Democrats that are scheduled to or, or has said that they're going to boycott today. In 2015, when BB spoke, I think it was about 60. So that's clearly loud and growing. You know, I don't know. I don't I have no clue what her worldview is. Um, and, and, you know, she hasn't really expressed one. Matt, she doesn't have a team. Right. You know, Biden had uh, some longtime Biden aides like Blinken was a longtime Biden aide. He had a lot of uh, second term Obama people. Uh, and I just don't know who the vice president would surround herself with uh, if she wins. I mean, she seems to be more than happy to capitulate to the far left. Uh, one thing I want you to explain, though, because you've been covering politics for a long time, um, and, and, and I was looking at some of, some of your more recent pieces. I thought you could explain this to us. You said that uh, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, that she actually destroyed the primary process in the 2024 presidential race, so that's this race. So can you explain that? I, I know foreign policy, Matt, you know the politics a lot better than me. So how has the Democratic Party, how should they have let this process play out? And, and what do you mean by that the primary process was destroyed this year on the Democratic side? Well, sure, I mean, what I mean is that the Democrats held a primary in 2024, it was <laughs> an open primary, a primary that uh, they've held uh, basically for the past 50 years, every four years, since the 1972 election. This is how presidential nominations have been structured through the primary process. And so they held a primary, Joe Biden won the primary. Um, they actually blocked out a lot of uh, contestants. Um, he had very minimal challenges because they wanted to protect him, but he won. And in the space of uh, a month, uh, Nancy Pelosi worked behind the scenes to nullify the results of that primary and switch the Democratic nominee with uh, 107 days left before an election. So where does this leave us? It leaves us, I think, in a position of wondering, well, what's the good of a primary? If you get into a situation where you decide your candidate is unlikely to win, hence we need to replace him or her, no matter how close we are to the election, why have a primary at all? Now, many people pointed out on Twitter X where I posted this, this thought, Morgan, that, well, maybe it's not such a bad thing if we don't have primaries anymore. Uh, we've had kind of primaries put up candidates who aren't that electable. Maybe it'd be better to go back to a system where we, the uh, party decides the candidate you know, inside vape-filled rooms. And that could be the case. But I do think it's important to recognize that we're living in historic times uh, not, mm. We have the first back-to-back, uh, -back, if Biden serves out the rest of his term, it will be the first back-to-back -back single terms of opposite parties in more than 100 years. This is the first time a nominee, an incumbent president, has decided not to run for re-election in 56 years. And it's the latest. Wait, did he decide, Matt? I mean, did well, he decide? Right. Or did, did the, he, the machine he'll, decided Maybe he'll explain him. himself tonight, right? I mean, at 8 p.m. tonight, right. Eastern time. That's a good point. Give an address. 
You, that's a great point, Matt. I, I haven't even talked about that this morning. We saw proof of life yesterday, so he's there. Yeah. You know, one thing Usually. I want to follow up on that you also wrote, you know, uh, Matthew Continetti, in mid-July, you wrote this piece about the Democrats' no-win scenario, as you called it, um, in November. Now, this was largely based on Biden's performance at the debate with President Trump, former President Trump, and his performance at the NATO summit. A lot has happened since then. Trump was nearly assassinated. RNC convention was a great success. But of course, uh, now Biden is not seeking another term and, and the vice president is sort of getting the high that you know you would get from announcing. Um, we're all supposed to be elated that somebody with ovaries is running apparently, um, which is not how I vote you know, by any means. Um, but with all of that said, do you still believe in what you wrote in mid-July that the Democrats cannot win in November? Well, uh, I do think that their Democrats face a big problem. And the, the problem with Biden was the no-win scenario, which is you were destined to lose with Biden as the candidate, but swapping him out, if that were even achievable, would present a whole new set of problems. So it does turn out that we don't really know why, but Biden did announce that he was no longer going to be running for the presidency. And they have quickly swapped him out for the vice president, Kamala Harris. Now, as you suggest, Morgan, the media's reaction is as if this election is over, that all of a sudden Kamala Harris, Kamala mania is going to sweep the nation and she is going to ride into the White House on a golden chariot. I don't think that's actually going to be the case. While I do think she may make the election slightly more competitive, the Democrats still face challenges. One of the big challenges is they've replaced a Biden who still had kind of some connection to the working class in this country with a California liberal who is mm -hmm. a creature of the left, who has no connection to the working class. And you li we look at her two first speeches, they are their left-wing speeches. When she ran for the presidency in 2020, she didn't make it to the Iowa caucus. She supported right. Medicare for all. She supported fracking bans. Right. So there will be vulnerabilities to this candidate that I believe the Trump campaign will expose. And I think the American people might have a second look at Kamala and decide they don't want to take the risk. Uh, and by the way, she still has to answer for the Biden administration, the Biden legacy, the inflation, the border, the fact that the world is a total mess. So I, I see her having some potential strengths. I mean, she can read from a teleprompter, unlike President Biden. <laughs> but I think there are also serious weaknesses that the Democrats will have to deal with. Yeah, I can't wait for those debates. Um, and you know what? Everyone's saying, oh, how, how is former President Trump going to run against a woman? He ran against a woman in 2016 uh, so he, and defeated her. So he has experience uh, doing so. You know, say what you want about Barack Obama. I mean, he was certainly a lightweight whenever he came in from a, a policy perspective uh, only uh, because he was new, right? He was still somewhat inexperienced senator whenever he started to run for the presidency. However, Matt, President uh, Obama, when he was a then candidate, he earned that nomination. Uh, I'm getting the hook. We're going to, we're in less than a minute, so I'm going to let you talk. But President Obama earned that nomination. That's the big difference. I mean, uh, Kamala Harris is similarly a policy lightweight, but she hasn't done anything from electoral perspective, from a primary perspective, to earn the nomination the way Barack Obama had to. Dean Phillips, the congressman from Minnesota who challenged Joe Biden earlier this year and said he was unelectable and turned out to be right. And Dean Phillips has more mm -hmm. Democratic primary votes than Kamala Harris ever has. I think you're exactly oh, right, man. Morgan. Co Obama was a cultural phenomenon beginning yeah. in 2004 yeah. with his speech to the DNC. He had a huge base of support. He put together a coalition. Right. He won that primary against Hillary Clinton. Kamala Harris is Fair untested and, and unpopular. 